thank you for being with us. As we begin here at 5 o'clock, we start with the devastating impact of our historic heat wave. More than 100 deaths across the Pacific Northwest, including more than 60 in Oregon, may be tied to the record-breaking heat that started last Friday. Kristen Severance is in the newsroom with the details. Kristen, this is just horrible news. Oh, just these numbers. Oregon State Police reports 63 people died across the state from heat since Friday. 45 of those deaths were in Multnomah County. Now, for comparison here, between 2017 and 2019, there were only 12 deaths statewide from hyperthermia. Hyperthermia is an abnormally high body temperature caused by a failure of the body to deal with heat coming from the environment. Now, the ages of people who died in Multnomah County ranged from 44 years old to 97 years old. Now, many of the people who died had underlying health conditions, and county officials said these people died alone without air conditioning. A county spokesperson said the overwhelming majority of people died in their homes, and we don't know right now how many of the deaths are homeless. This event did not just affect people who were without shelter, who are living outside. This is folks who are in, in an apartment building without air conditioning, who didn't get a cross breeze, who didn't have a place that cooled off at all, who didn't have anywhere else to go, who might be living alone. There were more than 500 heat related hospital and urgent care visits in the Portland metro area since Friday. We've also learned of between five to 10 heat related deaths in Clark County. And just again, these numbers are just they're so high. And just a reminder to really check on our neighbors and Tragic. really check on people, you know, you know, across the, the area. For sure. Kristen. So important. Thank right. you, Kristen. And it's good advice right now because for a lot of folks, they're still living in, in really high temperatures in the 90s. Uh, Matt Safino joins us now, Chief Meteorologist, talking uh, about the closer impact uh, of this heat and where it is not over yet. Yeah, that's right, Dan. We've cooled off mercifully here on the west side, have the cloud cover in the 70s. It's all good, but not the case for much of the northwest. The inland northwest, east of the Cascades, really down into Nevada and California, and then clear on up through eastern Washington, still under an excessive heat warning and that goes now until Sunday. So several more days of excessively hot days for this part of eastern Oregon and Washington, which is a big percentage of our state, extends over in Idaho, Montana, and as I said, down into California and Nevada, we've got heat advisories too. So super hot weather. It's just that west of the Cascades, we have cooled off. But if you look at the number of fatalities, weather related fatalities, both last year and on a 10 year average and a 30 year average, it's heat that really stands out. The yellow bar, that's the 30 year average, and it way outdoes any of the other weather groups, flooding, lightning, tornadoes, hurricanes, winter, cold, and the like. 138 heat, heat, fat, heat deaths uh, per year on the long-term average. Now last year, it was in fifth place. 51 heat-related deaths in the United States last year. That was less than wind, that was less than uh, tornadoes, less than flooding, but if you look at the long-term averages, it's heat that's the big killer, and it really uh, targets the elderly population more than the younger population for the reasons, many of the reasons Kristen just described. So again, uh, we're right in line with that going forward. 79 was our high in Portland today, but look, it's still super hot. It was 109 in Hermiston today. More on the heat in eastern Oregon and the thunderstorms that are hitting that part of the state as well. Guys, in a bit, back to you. Our heat was deadly. Thank you, Matt. An investigation is underway after a farm worker died during the heat wave. It happened Saturday at Ernst Nursery and Farms in St. Paul. According to Oregon OSHA, the man died from heat related causes. The high temperature in St. Paul that day was 104 degrees. The employee was working on a crew uh, moving irrigation lines and at the end of the shift, he was found unresponsive in the field. Oregon OSHA opened investigations into Ernst and Brother Farm Labor Contractor, which provided workers for the nursery that day. The contractor told the Associated Press the man who died came from Guatemala a few months ago. KGW reached out to Ernst Nursery and Farms, but we haven't heard back yet. A swimmer who disappeared in the Sandy River is presumed dead. He went missing in the Dabney State Recreation Area yesterday afternoon. The swimmer reportedly was not wearing a life jacket. Rescuers had to deal with poor water visibility and strong currents due to melting runoff from Mount Hood. Late last night, they said the search is now a recovery effort. A brush fire burning in Wasco County 
has grown to more than 10,000 acres. The Rentham Market Fire is east of Dufer and south of the Dalles. Some places are under a level three go now evacuation order. Governor Brown has invoked the Emergency Conflagration Act. It allows fire, the fire marshal to bring in extra resources to help try and fight this fire. That includes our local agencies. Portland Fire sent a few crews there this morning. The governor has also declared a state of emergency due to the wildfire threat in Oregon. And that fire really underscores the importance of having the resources that we need to fight our wildfires. Today, governors from all the western states, including Oregon's Governor Brown, talked to President Biden about what's needed. The president introduced several wildfire initiatives, including development of technology to detect wildfires, adding more air resources and firefighters on the ground. President Biden also wants to pay firefighters more, at least $15 an hour plus bonuses. Last week, I learned that some of our federal firefighters are being paid less than $13 an hour. Come on, man, this is, that's unacceptable to me. And I immediately directed my team to take decisive action to fix it. Biden will have to work with Congress to put some of his plans in motion. Each year since 2015, the U.S. has experienced on average roughly 100 more large wildfires than the year before. Because of the fire danger, there will be a campfire ban on local national forest lands. This covers any kind of open fire, even in developed campgrounds. The restrictions start tomorrow in the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area and Friday in both the Gifford Pinchot and Mount Hood National Forest. Now, things like portable cooking stoves and heating devices are still OK as long as they can be instantly turned off. As the 4th of July weekend approaches, some officials on the coast are a little worried about the crowds. Tillamook County expects to quadruple its population over that holiday weekend. And with wildfires in mind, county officials are especially concerned about fireworks. Fireworks is a major, major concern. And what I'm going to ask is, is if you're coming out to the North Oregon coast to Tillamook, especially, please leave your fireworks at home. Do your part to to lower the fire danger and the risk of, of having a repeat of what we had last year. That's Sheriff Brown. He says people should also keep water safety in mind this weekend and be prepared to sit in some traffic as many will be heading to the coast. Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler has a message for locals too ahead of the holiday weekend. Consider staying in town. Today he promoted the city's Here for Portland campaign to encourage people to stick around. TriMet and the Portland streetcar will be free on all routes from July 3rd through the 5th. Bike Town is also offering discounts. The Here for Portland campaign started last year and it's meant to encourage local shopping and eating to help our businesses recover from the pandemic and other hardships. And on that note, today is a day that many businesses and people in general have been waiting for. Oregon and Washington are dropping most of the COVID restrictions. KGW's Pat Doris reports. At Portland's Providence Park, hundreds of guests invited by the governor's office sat shoulder to shoulder without masks, a powerful sign that Oregon is moving past the crisis of the pandemic. Among those in attendance, Hector Calderon, there in the black shirt, Oregon's very first known COVID patient. And up north in Tacoma, traditional dancers celebrated at a park, and Governor Jay Inslee declared his state open for business again. We got a little flag. I'll tell you this, this flag says Washington is ready. We are ready to open our restaurants. We are ready to open our theaters. We're ready to go to the ball games. We're ready to reopen Washington. We're ready to keep getting vaccines. Let's give it Washington. We're ready and we are open. Go Washington. All right. Back in Portland, Oregon Health Director Patrick Allen asked for one minute of silence to remember those who did not survive the COVID virus. Let's bow our heads for a moment of silent memory for every Oregonian we've lost to COVID-19. Rukaya Adams from the Meyer Memorial Trust recalled how leaders from the black and brown communities confronted the governor and OHA early in the pandemic, worried their communities would face the most harm from the virus. We were critical. We were angry. We were afraid. And they listened. They showed patience in the face of fear and outrage. And you know what? They responded. Governor Kate Brown said she was a bag of emotions today. She thanked medical professionals and grocery workers and everyone who played a part in helping Oregon get through the worst of COVID. 
And of course, we are celebrating that today, Oregon is 100% fully open. Ceremonies like the one held here today are important to mark the beginning and the ends of things. And the message from both Oregon and Washington is that COVID is no longer going to dominate our thinking or our lives. In Southwest Portland, Pat Doris, KGW News. With Oregon reopening, sports are returning to normal too. Oregon Ducks football, the Portland Thorns, and the Portland Timbers have all announced their stadiums are returning to full capacity. The changes at Providence Park for soccer games start on July 11th. No proof of vaccination will be required. As for Ducks football, the first home game is September 4th. Fans won't have to show proof of vaccination, but those who don't have their COVID shots should wear a mask. Oregon State hasn't announced plans for the fall just yet.